Welcome back to another Motobob video where today we're looking at the best new touring motorcycles on the market for 2022. And this one is actually a pretty good list. You see a couple of years back, adventure bikes looked to have killed off the dedicated touring machines. But this year, I feel like we've had a bit of a revival and there's a good selection on the market. So first up, we'll go through eight of the best new and updated models in price order ascending. And then at the end, I'll tell you the best of the rest that they're up against. But before we get started, a massive thanks to Speedo Angels for sponsoring the channel. They make these dash protectors that only cost a few quid, but could save you hundreds, if not thousands, replacing your dash if it got scratched or damaged. Take the 2018 Yamaha Tracer 900, for example, a super popular sports tourer, and a new dash for that would cost just shy of 800 quid. Now they've got products for most of the bikes on this list, so check out the link in the description, and there's a 20% discount code for my viewers down there too. Now let's start at the bottom of the pricing tree and it's the new Triumph Tiger Sport 660 which they've intentionally priced that way to compete with the other budget friendly bikes like the Yamaha Tracer 7 and the Kawasaki Versus 650. It's a little bit more expensive than those two options but in almost every department it's a little bit better. It's got more power a more refined feel owing to the triple cylinder engine, great handling and good tech too with all of the features carried over from the Trident 660 with which it shares a platform. Now I've not ridden the final production bike yet, I'm expecting one pretty soon, but last year I was lucky enough to ride one of the final prototypes from the factory in Hinkley. Personally, I thought it was brilliant. Like I say, all of the best stuff of the Trident, but with a taller, more open riding position, better wind protection, and more space for a passenger and luggage, all of which contribute to a much more versatile machine. And it has to be said, in that red finish, it's quite a good looking bike too. Definitely one to think about for anyone who's considering the Tracer or the Versus, and assuming that final production bike is pretty damn close to the prototype that I rode, I'd strongly urge you to at least take one for a spin. So that's the main new entrant in the smaller, more affordable end of the market, but what about the mid to large sporty Taurus? Well, Suzuki always seem to manage to offer great performance at a very tempting price point, just like they did earlier last year when they announced the new GSX-1000 Naked, and so it's no surprise that this touring focused adaptation entitled the GSX S1000 GT has gone down a storm with pretty much anyone who's had chance to ride it. You get a buttery 999cc inline four that makes about 150 horsepower, which should be more than enough to carry yourself, a passenger and some luggage at a good clip over long distances. It certainly looks competitive on paper with its closest rival and that's the Kawasaki Ninja 1000 SX. A tried and tested by that's super popular, it's a big seller here in the UK. And so if Suzuki can take even a slice of its market share, they'll be onto a good thing. And yeah, you get good hardware, so decent Brembo brakes, some adjustability in the fork and shock, and also some shrewdly selected electronics. You see stuff like a few power modes, cruise control as standard, and a decent TFT dash with phone connectivity to enable navigation, are far more meaningful on a Tora in my book than dialing in loads of parameters for all the latest IMU enable rider rates. And they'll have chosen to omit that stuff to keep the price reasonable, which they have. It's right in line with the Kawasaki and some of the other sporty tourers like the Tracer 9 GT. And there's another new player in this particular slice of the market, but for me, it offers something a little different. It's the Honda NT 1100, and I was amongst the first to ride it at the press launch just outside Barcelona, and I have to say, it really did impress me. Not because it's super sporty and quick and pointed. Those other bikes offer way more power and thrills. This NT 1100 is actually heavily based upon the Africa Twin, so it's got pretty much the same engine and pretty much the same chassis. So it tops out at around 100 horsepower and it definitely biases more towards stability and comfort than it does to twitchy quick handling but I reckon it's a better bike for it. What they've really designed is a workhorse that's super practical and well thought out. The fact that cruise control, heated grips, a center stand and side cases all come as standard should give you some sort of idea 
as to what it's about. Sure, the engine doesn't have loads of top end, but it's got torque and strength in the low to mid range where realistically, it's gonna spend a lot of its life. And even though it does inherit the frame from an adventure bike, the 17 inch wheels and road focus tires are enough to make it plenty of fun on the right sort of roads. On top of that, it's got loads of wind protection. It's super comfortable. You've got the option of DCT and it comes with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto connectivity. So again, not the one to go for if you really love to push it, but if you look at the list of equipment, surely these are gonna sell well. Now we just listed a bunch of Japanese bikes, but if you want something with a little more European flair, then you might wanna consider the Moto Guzzi V100. Now for me, in its centenary colors of silver and green with the gold wheels, bikes don't get much better looking than this. From what I've seen in the comments though, it's a bit of an acquired taste, but for me it's distinctive, it's got some unmistakably Moto Gutsy cues, but at the same time it's fresh for them and interesting to look at. And look, the specs aren't bad either. You've got good power from its new liquid cool V-twin, good brakes from Brembo, the option to go for some semi-active Olin suspension, and all the electronics that you could ever need from a contemporary motorcycle in 2022. Is it really a Tourer though? Well, yes and no, and I really mean yes and no because it can flick between the two without you even noticing. It's got a windscreen and it's got some deflectors to reduce the air pressure on the rider so with those both doing their job you could conceivably call it a sports tourer but they're tied into the riding mode so based upon the mode you've got selected and your current speed they'll either pop up or down electronically meaning it can transform almost into a naked bike. Either way it looks incredible and I can't wait to try one. Also in the naked bike come Tora category, we've got the KTM Super Duke GT, and this one got some nice little updates for the new model year. As you might have guessed from the name, it's got plenty in common with their super naked, the 1290 Super Duke R, including that incredible 1301cc V-twin that makes a whopping 175 horsepower and 141 newton meters of peak torque. Naturally, you get their later semi-active suspension with automatic preload adjustment, anti-dive, and the damping tied into the riding modes. There's all the electronics, plenty of wind protection, and new for this year, some lighter wheels lifted from the Super Duke car, a new 7-inch TFT display featuring an updated turn-by-turn -turn nav system, and a fresh lick of paint. So look, fairly modest updates, but fundamentally, this is still some bike. All the fun of the Super Duke, but with a little more versatility. Now, We've crossed the 20 grand threshold, which really is getting into the serious money, but this is a serious amount of bike. The K1600 from BMW. A proper big tourer, massive windscreen and fairing, plenty of luggage options, electronically adjustable suspension, and loads of power and torque from its big, smooth inline six engine, all makes it sound like a recipe for super comfy success. For 2022, it got a few nice tweaks and a surprising omission. Now I like the big 10.25 inch TFT display that you get on a few of their other bikes. It's pretty much the best motorcycle screen on the market because it's got loads of space and it's well laid out. And I also like the new paint job. On paper, this meteoric dust option with the galactic transfer printing sounds like it shouldn't work, but I saw it in the flesh at Motorcycle Live and I absolutely loved it. It's a surprising choice for what's normally quite a reserved looking bike, but it really does work when you see it up close. That emission though, I was really surprised that this bike didn't get their active cruise control with a radar at the front. When you watch the original videos from a couple of years back when BMW first introduced the idea of active cruise control on a bike, they used I mean, it's renders, but they use the K1600s. Then the first bike they announced with it was the R1250RT, which is a slightly smaller Tourer. And then the R18 Transcontinental and Bagger got it. And I thought, well, it's only a matter of time before it comes to the K1600. It's perfect for it, a big touring cruising bike. They've already got the tech, but it didn't get it this year. And I don't know why. And I asked BMW and they said, no, nah, it's not got it. And we're not saying anymore. Perhaps they didn't want to redesign the front end to accommodate the radar. Maybe the K1600 is due a bigger update in the next year or two. Who knows? But one bike that did get it, in fact the first Japanese motorcycle to employ radar tech, is the Ninja H2SX. 
Now this was already a heck of a bike, the ultimate sports tourer perhaps. It gets their supercharged inline four from their other H2 label bikes, so it's easily the most powerful bike on this list at just under 200 horsepower. And then the upspec SE version, you get the Brembo style Emma brakes and their semi-active suspension. It really does look like a very fast and comfy package. But 2022 really takes the tech up a notch with both front and rear radars. So you get the adaptive cruise control, but also front collision warnings, and the rear radar gives you blind spot warnings in the mirrors. And that's all on top of the TFT dash with phone connectivity, emergency stop signals, hill hold control, tire pressure monitoring, keyless ignition, cornering headlights, cruise control, quick shifter, launch control, lean sensitive ABS and traction control, power modes. It's like the opposite of the Suzuki that I talked about earlier, which shunned a lot of this stuff to keep the price sensible. This thing though, it's anything but sensible and neither is the price. So 21 grand for the regular model, 24,000 for the SE version. But I rank this list on starting price and the new BMW R18B and Transcontinental start at 21,500 for the B and 23,300 for the Transcontinental. This is another one I've had the absolute pleasure of riding. They did a launch event in the UK last year and it was quite an experience. It's a big and bold chromed out bike and the finish is absolutely impeccable. So it feels special even before you get on it and ride it. On the road, it's super planted and the big boxer twin has plenty of character. It doesn't feel quite as punchy as it does in the naked R18s and that's because it's got the same amount of power, but but these bikes are a bit heavier. In fact, the Transcontinental is about, I think it was 420 something kilograms, which makes it heavier even than the equivalent offerings from Harley and Indian that it's clearly setting out to steal some market share from. Still, you'd never expect a bike like this to be a lightweight, and so you've got to ride it accordingly. But in a straight line, it's supremely comfortable. It feels really special to ride, and it has a bit more style and pizzazz and character than something like the K1600 or a Goldwing. And one advantage it does have over the American bikes is the price, which might not sound cheap on the face of it, but actually it undercuts them by quite a margin. So those are the new bikes for 2022. I was expecting maybe more from Harley and Indian, but it's pretty much just paint updates for this year. Harley do have a launch event later this week though, which they're teasing with the words further, faster. So I'd expect some sort of sporty tourer from them. If you've not subscribed already, hit subscribe and I'll tell you all about that bike as soon as it's announced. But yeah, what about the rest of the bikes that these ones are up against? Well, at the smaller end of the spectrum, I've already said that I'd probably take the Tiger Sport 660 over the others, even with the slightly higher cost. It just felt that little bit better all round to me and worth the extra cash. In the mid capacity bikes, we've got some great new options, but the Tracer 9 GT is the one that still catches my eye. That triple cylinder engine is so much fun and the spec looks pretty great for the money. But of course, you've still got to consider the XRs from BMW and then also some of the more road focused adventure bikes like the Ducati Multistrada V2 or the Triumph Tiger 900 GT Pro. Beyond that, the BMW R1250 RT really impressed me when I rode it last year. It's a little bit bigger, has more presence, and offers a lot of the features and comforts of the K1600, but it does get active cruise control, and it's just a little bit lighter on its feet. If you do want to go for an even bigger, like proper tourer for weekends and weeks away. Well, the American style tourers, and that includes the R18, they're just a little bit too cumbersome for me on the smaller, tighter UK roads. So for me personally, it'd be between the Goldwing and the K1600. Now I've always loved the Goldwing with that automatic DCT box. It's a brilliant bike, superbly comfortable, smoother than cream, and it'll hustle surprisingly well to boot. So those are my picks, but it's all a little bit of personal taste. So let me know your favorites for this year down in the comments below. And if you're new here and you want to see more videos like this, hit subscribe and I'll catch you next time.